Um, but thank you for having me. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about getting the most out of key gas monitoring. This has come up uh, quite a bit with customers uh, lately. Um, I had an example come in just a week or so ago where uh, a customer had gathered some acetylene and hydrogen and uh, hydrogen not to terrible levels, but he was saying, well, it, he was wanting some type of monitoring. It was a actually a distribution type unit, and, but he was saying, well, hydrogen wouldn't have tipped him off. And uh, yes, it would have, but it would have had to been on rate of change. Anyway, just just different ways of looking at at, at this type different types of gas monitoring that you can use, and how to, how to really get the most out of those. So I, I think the biggest question you, you, you have to ask yourself is really when, when you're looking at online DTA monitoring, what are you trying to accomplish? Um, as Randy mentioned, I worked for Memphis Light, Gas and Water. Uh, I was actually there for about 28 years. Um, and we went back and forth quite a bit from multi-gas to single gas. When I moved into an asset management role, I, I looked at what we were using. And with the multi-gas, it's like, you know, we're really not using the monitoring to do analytics. So a lot like a lot of, much like a lot of companies you run into, we, if we got an alarm out of something, we'd go take a manual sample. <laughs> we'd investigate further, um, in which case single gas would really be, be the way to go. I, I mean, I, multi-gas, you're looking at, you know, 40,000 plus dollars with single gas that can be down as low as a couple of grand. So it, rather than being selective of where I wanted to put my monitoring, if I went to multi-gas, I could actually take single gas and do a large portion of my fleet uh, while staying within budget constraints constraints. So when we start looking at it, single gas or, or composite gas, and I would, you know, these are, these are based on the uh, composite gas, often a fuel cell technology where it's single, you'll have a uh, more of a solid state technology a lot of times. Uh, but the, the, the basic, these are both based on detecting hydrogen generation uh, in transformer. So why hydrogen? Well, hydrogen, uh, it, it generates through all of our, uh, it, it generates through all the thermal ranges that the transformers see. So generally you'll see that start at about 150 degrees C and through everything up to, you know, a thousand degrees C when we're up to acetylene production, we should start still be seeing hydrogen, whereas these other gases tend to uh, scission into to different gases as we get hotter in the transformer. Uh, it, 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 can, it can identify fault type. And, and this is the set of it. So if we're having hydrogen, um, you know, we just know we've exceeded that 150 degrees C mark, uh, but we really don't know. Did we have an arc in this transformer? Is this localized overheating? Uh, so it really only serves as sort of a smoke detector uh, is how I like to think of it and let me know that, hey, I, I've got something going on here. It's much like your house. It's, you, you have something on fire in your house. You don't know where you're going to have to investigate further, but it does let you know in the early stages that something happened. So if we go to multi-gas, we can have three, five, seven, nine gases, depending on how in detail you'd want to look at these. Uh, it does allow for an assessment, assessment and identification of faults. Uh, so I can look and say, okay, I've got a really good arcing signature, or I've got PD that is uh, worsening, and I'm starting to see development of ethane and then the ethylene. Um, so also with the seven, if you get to seven gases, now we're getting into having carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, uh, which I'll go into how I look at those in a little bit. And it's a little unique um, in the way I do it, uh, but that really gives me uh, a good idea about cellulose degradation. You know, how much, how much thermal damage am I doing to my solid insulation systems? So with the single gas, again, it, it's there to provide an early warning. Um, and we are mostly looking at 
at hydrogen with this. Um, something I, I've been looking into a lot here recently is installing it in the headspace of a transformer uh, when available uh, as as opposed to installing a drain valve for oil all the time uh, and just how, how much quicker are those detection rates. And we'll get into that in some of our future slides, but it is available at a, a very low a very low price point for for this type of monitoring and again it does give you a pretty good level of protection uh, and indication concerning something starting to go awry with our transformer so since we're talking about monitoring just just a real quick refresher and i'm sure a, a lot of you have probably uh, are pretty well versed on this, but for those of you who aren't, just just to kind of go over uh, what these gases mean and what we're kind of looking for. Uh, so I always like to break it down to, into temperatures. Uh, the, I, I just feel like that's the easiest to understand. Uh, you'll you'll read, uh, especially if you go in the new C fifty seven one four, you'll see. Uh, there's some talk of normalized uh, energy index and the joules, but uh, just just to keep it simple, I, I learned it this way, and I still kind of like to look at it this way. Uh, it has served me well over my career. So when we start looking, at, like I said, around 150 degrees C, uh, you'll start seeing hydrogen and methane being produced. Uh, when that temperature climbs up around 250 degrees C, we will not see methane being produced uh, in, in great levels anymore, but that will be now converted over to an ethane type gas. Um, at 350 degrees C, that ethane will now become ethylene, and around 500 ethylene starts to, um, to, to break down into acetylene. Uh, now, again, you will still still see hydrogen being generated through all of these temperatures. And so acetylene, often that's associated with art. That's uh, generally when people get DGA reports, the first thing they go to is like, oh, I've got acetylene. Uh, acetylene is not necessarily always arcing. It can be a thermal condition, and we're going to look at some of that. Uh, I, I have some examples of what that looks like. Um, but it does. DGA does these these indicators provide us early indication of incipient faults. Um, allows us to do some diagnosis of the thermal conditions that are occurring, and it's a, it's a good overall assessment of transformer health. Um, again, this is not the only thing. This is just uh, you know what's going on inside the main tank. Uh, for true health, I mean, we'd have to look at LTCs. Uh, you have to look at bushings, but for the core and coil, this is probably one of the better tests. If I had only a single test I could run on transformer, DGA would definitely be the, the thing I would do. Um, so did I skip a slide there? Hold on, excuse me. No, I guess I went right in. So this is kind of small and I do apologize, but but I wanted to show the entire history because I, I, I think it was a it was a fairly interesting case. Um, and this was one I had while I was at the utility. And this is a good example of where, um, yes, we do have some acetylene, but there was no arcing occurring in this instance. So this was some, some severe overheating. So if, if we go down to 1999, uh, when the first sample was pulled, we looked pretty good. Uh, everything I would say was fairly normal with this, with this sample. Uh, we see we had eight parts of hydrogen. Uh, we had no acetylene present, 19 parts of ethylene. Uh, not, nothing here that would really cause me to have any, any suspicion that I had anything occurring uh, in this transformer. However, when we move ahead to May of 2001, I can now see I have two parts of acetylene and 44 parts of hydrogen, uh, 142 parts of ethylene. So, so I wanted to show this because this is not really, uh, this type of signature is not really indicative that we've had an arc. Uh, when I see ethylene in that high level compared to acetylene, uh, it, just, it, it just looks like 
some some localized heating uh, or, or you know something general and so you can see that we we sampled this a lot we got up to as high as 575 parts of ethylene at one period uh, acetylene had kind of gone away I uh, didn't really see any generation of that but we we're still producing considerable amounts of hydrogen and uh, methane and ethane gases as well during this um, so this was kind of where I started uh, well actually it had been several failures I had to examine prior to this but this also this sample was one where I really started looking at carbon oxide ratios uh, and I've got several papers floating around out there on that if anybody wants to look into it. But the way the ratio was acting and the way the gassing was happening, it's, it really led me to believe that, okay, well, I don't really have a lot of solid insulation. Uh, so my paper is not being affected by whatever I have going on with this particular transformer, uh, which just made me that much more determined to keep going in and, and, and looking. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump that quick. So, so it okay. turned out that it was a, a connection issue is what we were having with this transformer. Uh, that was just overheating. And again, something that needed to be addressed, but not necessarily failure of the transformer. In fact, this, this transformer is still in service today. Um, so going back, um, so if, if we go only with, with, with hydrogen levels, this is the, the older, um, C57104. Uh, there has been some some updates to this at this point, and they're also looking at how much oxygen is in the transformer. So there's been a few changes in this. Um, but looking at that previous slide, if we take those, uh, using total PPM for hydrogen, uh, we would have never even exceeded condition one uh, with the previous sample. Like I said, we, we got 60, 80 parts. However, one of the points I really want to make, if when you if you were to decide to go with a single gas type monitoring, a, a hydrogen monitor transformer condition, I really feel like rate of change is what you've got to look at with that. Um, you know, I, I like setting mine down around 25 parts per million, rate of change over a 24-hour period. Uh, you will have some some uh, migration back and forth between gas and oil phases. And also if you are looking at oil, there's kind of a, it's, it's not a very homogenous distribution of hydrogen. So levels will go up now, but generally 25 parts per million is enough that, that you'll, you'll blank out a lot of those false alarms. But when you have an active event such as was occurring in the previous example, you would get an alarm on that. However, if you go in and just set standard, you know, I, I want to know when I go from condition, it get into condition one. Uh, so we go to this standard 100 parts per million and we set it on a total PPM alarm value. Depending on the transformer you're on, that's you're either not going to get an alarm in a case where you would need one, or a lot of times I've seen where 100 was completely normal operation uh, for, for how a transformer was being being loaded, uh, in which case you would get false alarm, false alarm on that, uh, which is the cardinal sin of, of any kind of monitoring, because at that point, the monitoring gets ignored. Uh, so I, I really, hydrogen, I feel that rate of change is the way we need to look at, the, at that. Uh, however, when we look at the ethylene levels that were produced in that previous sample, um, it was actually at a condition four, you know, a, a get out of service. Um, so again, we, we're we're kind of back to uh, taking all these pieces and, and putting them together. What's my acetylene value? What's my ethylene? So ethylene that high, it's like, yes, I have a very high level thermal fault. However, not not necessarily an arc going on and looking at the way it's gassing, probably not involving my windings to any great degree. Um, and like I said, it did end up being primary lead type issue with that transformer. Uh, so just there's it's solving this puzzle with with DGA is more than any one value of one gas. Uh, there, there's a lot of pieces you kind of have to tie together. 
Um, and also, it, it's really important to understand, like I said, when setting alarm levels, to understand the correlation between the loading, thermal condition, gassing patterns, as they are very specific to, to different transformers and how that transformer is being operated. Now, with hydrogen, and we talked a little bit about looking at hydrogen in the gas basin. Like I said, this is something that I've, I've, I've done quite a bit of experimenting on, um, more of a lab type environment. Uh, and then also looking over older GGA samples where you would see, you would see gassing that would indicate, well, man, it sure looks like I should have hydrogen. Uh, I have a lot of ethane. Uh, and you would think I would have some hydrogen generated yet relatively low parts, which which always bothered me when I was in its utility because it just didn't seem to really uh, line up with what, what I was being taught. Um, so, so if we look at hydrogen alone, it, it is the least soluble um, of all the all, of all these hot metal gases that we'll see generated. Uh, about five percent uh, of being all. Uh, in fact, if you if you look at normal operating uh, values for a transformer. Uh, and you do have a gas, which I had a lot of nitrogen blanketed transformers, not a lot of conservator tanks. Uh, there's going to be a ratio of approximately 20 to 1 uh, hydrogen in the gas space versus what's in dissolved in oil. Um, and I actually did do some experiment on this where I was sparging hydrogen into small tanks. Uh, around seven gallons, sparging through oil, and seeing exactly when did uh, you, with a hydrogen monitor in the gas space pulling DGAs from the oil, and seeing how much longer it took me to detect the the correct levels. And uh, there was a, a considerable days difference, and even in that small a volume, uh, in the time. So generally within an hour or so, I would have reached the max level of hydrogen on my. So I was doing about a thousand parts per million hydrogen, uh, hydrogen in a nitrogen base. Within about an hour, generally my hydrogen monitor would have that much uh, representative 50 parts per million uh, on that 20 to 1 ratio. I would have that in the gas base. However, once I was looking at the oil, uh, it could take four or five days uh, to, to see that in, reflected in the DGA results. Also, something to take to consider also is it's dispersion hydrogen and oil. It's 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 non-homogeneous. Uh, it, it takes a long time for you to reach any type of equal equilibrium. Uh, so, if you're generating on the far side of the transformer and you are on the opposite of where the drain valley is, where you have your monitor mounted, and Assuming that you have a transformer that has very well sealed, uh, because hydrogen will escape to atmosphere rather quickly, uh, there's still going to be, depending on how that gets, are you that oil being pumped? Is it just natural convection? Uh, it's going to it's going to be a while before you're going to see that. Uh, it just takes it a long time to migrate and and reach equilibrium in the oil, which in gas it really happens rather quickly. Um, so this was a, I provided me from someone who does manufacture some testing they did on hydrogen sensors. And if we see on the left, this is in oil versus uh, in a gas. So if we see the one on the left is actually a, a hydrogen in oil, uh, hydrogen in nitrogen, um, where they were mixing. And you can see here, we they've actually reached the the total of the level of hydrogen about about an hour is is what you're looking at however if you look when they're sparging through oil uh the same setup with the 15 sensors uh we're, we're greater than 50 hours reaching that total so it's just another example of um they work in oil and, and it's definitely something we've done a long time but it does affect the the response time of the sensor considerably. So that was more commercial. Sorry, I thought I had pulled all those out. Um, 
So another important thing I think you really have to have in place at the YouTube when when you're running these tests or using monitoring is understanding what kind of response you you you're going to make. Uh, I was aware of an incident that happened a year or so ago where uh, there was 100 monitoring service. Uh, it pegged out at some point. There was an extreme rate of change. Uh, crew was dispatched to a substation to pull a sample of the oil. Uh, transformer failed when they were there to get the sample. Uh, luckily, no one was injured, but it was a, a catastrophic failure of the transformer. So understanding how we're going to respond to these alarms is also critical. Um, again, really, if you're, if you're hydrogen only, the, the only effective means of doing that is, is looking at a rate of change. Uh, you know, if it, it, when you get that alarm come in, you go back and look, well, if you've gotten 50 parts per minute of hydrogen and quickly uh, over the last couple of samples, it's grown that much. That's most likely, likely an, an active arcing event having in that transformer. Uh, so not something we really want to run a crew out and put them next to it at that point. Uh, that would be something where we'd have to consider we, we need to get this unit out of service. Uh, we, we likely have active arcing going on, uh, probably uh, catastrophic failures in the works. Um, if it is determined that that transformer, so we, we, we get an alarm, we look, and we've had hydrogen values growing over some some time. And this would be like, okay, well, we, we have picked up a 25 part per million rate of change, but we've done it over the last 24 hours. So it's, it's not a quick, uh, it's, it's not escalating quickly, but we do see it happen. In that case, we could roll our crews out, take our samples and, and figure out what we needed to do from there. Um, so once you get that sample pulled, now we need to start looking at the, okay, what are my methane? What's my ethylene? What's a settling value? So we're going to look at these other gases and do some analysis over what we think that problem is. And I always talk to any of my other asset people. Uh, it's like we really need to look at the hist history of that transformer as well. Um, I, I, any one DGA sample taken at a moment of time really doesn't provide you a lot of information. Uh, you need to know, you know, years of history or, 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 or as much history as you can give that transformer. And that would not just be, um, that would not just be the DGA history of that transformer, but also I, I would love to have a power factory his power factor history of that transformer as well to set next to that. Um, there's many times to lay those out and you'll see, okay, I've seen some changes in gassing. Oh, I'm seeing some changes in power factor. Just uh, as many of the pieces of this puzzle as we can gather before we start trying to solve it, it, it really helps us make an accurate uh, prediction about what kind of health we got into and help us make plans for what we're going to do uh, with that. You know, do we do we need, need to start planning on changing this transformer out? Is this something we can repair? And also the loading is another uh, another thing to um, to take into consideration. I think I have a uh, a slide coming up where there was a instance a utility had to perform a pretty good overload on a transformer and there was quite a bit of online monitoring and you could see how that was affecting that transformer in real time, uh, which is a pretty interesting slide. So interpreting the GGA. So we have got our hydrogen alarm. We understand we've got something going on this transformer. We're going to pull a manual sample and we're going to look at it. Uh, just to go over again, this is just the very basic, basic of doing this, but it's something that I feel like is a is a critical building block into understanding what I'm looking at when I look at these samples. So if we look at the top left, we're looking at an arcing in oil type signature. Uh, a good way to always uh, spot this spot this is generally we will see acetylene generated in about half the value of hydrogen. So hydrogen values will be double that of acetylene. Uh, ethylene 
will be generated somewhere around 10 to 20 percent of the acetylene value. Uh, we're going to see ethane would pretty much be two to three times that of ethylene uh, or methane, excuse me, and then ethane would be our lowest generated gas during these events. Uh, so when you see a signature, any similar, anything that that looks anything like this, most likely that's some type of arcing. Now, there's a couple of uh, couple of other notes with this that you know I'm seeing arcs that occurred in winding where you'll see pretty high ethylene values. And while I can't give you a definite explanation, I would think maybe as as the heat is dispersed out, we're going through temperatures where those ethylenes are produced, but it's. So the hydrogen to ethylene or hydrogen to acetylene, those are the ones I look at to say, okay, it's this active arcing event. Uh, to the right, we're looking at a partial discharge in oil. Um, again, uh, well, for starters, you're going to have a, a hydrogen methane are going to be what you're looking at. Uh, and again, though, a side note on this. This is always going to be partial discharge when you see this type of signature. Uh, to understand partial discharge, in my opinion, I, I need more than that one sample. Uh, if I'm seeing this kind of production year after year happening, uh, most likely I have some kind of slight overheating. Could be due to loading, could be due to some kind of deficiency in the transformer. But <clears throat> With partial discharge, as I'm looking at samples over time, generally what I'm looking for is, is this evolving? I, I've never seen a partial discharge event that just stayed hydrogen and methane. Uh, as those events grow and worsen over time, you'll start seeing some ethane being produced and then possibly some ethylene. So, so to truly, short of running a partial discharge or having partial discharge monitoring, it's truly understanding if it's partial discharge or not, generally partial discharge does evolve into a more severe condition over time. And you will see those, those higher thermal gases start being produced. <clears throat> so overheated oil, um, if we get in that, we're gonna see ethylene will by far be our dominant gas in those type signatures. Um, and again, Really, I, I don't like to say overheat at all. I like to think that this is more of a, I have something going on in my transformer that's in, in excess of 350 degrees for, for me to see this type of signature. So, so it's a severe thermal condition that needs to be looked into. Uh, but I don't know, is it oil, is it, is it in a winding? Uh, again, we're gonna kind of get into that. Uh, and then of course, overheated cellulose, uh, uh, carbon monoxide being our leading indicator. However, again, I would need to see some other gases also accompanying this, this acceleration of carbon monoxide production. Uh, so it wouldn't be flat like this. I would expect to see some, some ethylene, some ethane being produced in this type of signature as well. <clears throat> so we, we've already discussed this, and I apologize, it's got a bit ahead of myself, but if this is just kind of the ratio that we're, we're looking for, again, hydrogen in a two to one value, acetylene and ethylene in a 10 to one value, methane and ethane around a three to one value. Uh, and when you see this, so it, like if you're doing LTC type diagnostics, um, this is perfect. This is what you want to see. So I'm pulling TGAs on an LTC uh, where I have arcing and oil, not a vacuum, but arcing, arcing contacts. Uh, this would be a great looking signature. And I would assume that everything was fine with that tap changer when I pulled this. Uh, if I were to pull an LTC and see that I had a ton of ethylene being produced, and some ethane also joined this, and it was exceeding these levels of hydrogen, uh, of acetylene, then in that example, I would say, okay, I've got a, a contact that's starting to overheat in my tap changer. Uh, and then hydrogen in the tap changer is totally dependent. Uh, is this a free breathing tap changer? In which case you may not see any, any type of hydrogen uh, in the samples as it does escape the atmosphere so quickly. Uh, this would be a good example of a sealed arcing and oil tap changer. So, Showing you that 
I pulled two examples from the field to kind of, and I need to check my time. I've got to hurry along. Sorry. So two examples from the field. Uh, and, and so again, we look, we see our hydrogen and acetylene and we see, okay, this is definitely an arcing event. Uh, this is that higher ethylene values I said you would see. Uh, and, and again, that's, that's not uncommon at all. Uh, you know, depending on how that arc occurred and what parts of the transformer are involved. Um, but just to show the difference, I saw those. One of those was a winding failure, the one on the left, even though exactly almost identical signatures for both those. Uh, one of those was the primary lead at burn in half where it arced over to some bracing. And uh, I was able to predict this before. Before it happened, uh, this actually, the one on the right was not one of my transformers. And so the other things you have to take into account. Um, so like I said, I had done a lot of work in this. I, I was, I had a long enough career and was lucky or unlucky enough to see a lot of failures. And it was interesting when you have a failure, if you can walk back from that failure, go back on the history of those transformers and see, okay, was there anything here that could have tipped me off to, I was going to see a failure in this transformer. And so that's when I started doing a lot of work in the CO2 to CO ratio. And so the transformer on the left that had failed, where I'd had a total winding failure, uh, I was running about 120 parts of carbon dioxide to every one part of carbon monoxide. That was pre-event after the arc it was about a two to one uh I, so i had seen a severe drop in this ratio um however co2 over co looking at the one where i only had a lead failed so keep in mind we had a a, a primary lead that had arced to some bracing so i really didn't have windings involved uh with that fault at all uh, i only saw it drop about from seven parts for me and down, I mean, seven to one down to about five to one. Uh, so that being said, uh, this is the example of the online monitoring where I was, where I was talking about the loading. And so they were forced to push this into a bit of an overload for a brief period. And I, I think this slide really ties it together really nicely, what, I, what I've been showing you, because when they did step this load up, we see that CO2 to CO really started dropping. So that lets me know that, okay, I am getting very hot in my windings. So my windings have heated up. I'm starting to really affect the life of my paper at this point. Uh, when I look at the gassing for this transformer, so we have hydrogen, acetylene, ethylene, uh, and methane being produced here, we see that those all really went up uh, during the same period of this overload. And, and then the thing I found really interesting uh, was the amount of water that got pushed out of that paper during that overload. So this, this is H, uh, water being moisture being me measured in oil. We can see that when that overload occurred, naturally we heated the, the, the windings of the transformer up and turned the papers heated. And we have pushed that water out of that paper into the oil at that point. So this was just a really nice in real time to be able to see these three mechanisms kind of working together. Um, probably not time. So so trying to start wrapping this up so I can get done. Uh, so this would be the transformer that I showed you all the examples over. And this is the CO2 to CO ratio. Again, not a really linear thing, but we can see that it is moving on an upward trend. And again, when I see this ratio getting larger, that leads me to believe that I have healthy insulation at that point. I'm not seeing any type of heavy breakdown of the paper. And again, once it was tracked down to what was actually the problem with that transformer, it did end up being a, an internal connection. Uh, that was, it was an easy fix. Again, still in service today. Uh, so this was back in the 90s when this actually started having the late 90s. So uh, again, something that we were able to, looking at it from this angle to determine that this is something that can be fixed. Uh, it was not easy to find, but we did find it. And again, we, we've gotten 
30 years of life out of that transformer since this repair was made. So to support that, and I I, I went in the, the 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 shop there at work. Uh, I took actually took a 25 kV I altered 25 kV, uh, altered it. I put a I, I welded a thermal well into it. So I drilled into the side of this. I drilled one section that went all the way up into the the windings. I had another section to insert this thermal well that was only uh, in oil. It, it was making no contact with the paper whatsoever. And I wanted to heat that up over time and see what did that, what does that look like? Let me go back. Um, so I started out, I put the heating element, I placed it where it was in contact, the, the thermal well was in direct contact with the windings of the transformer and I start heating it up. And I, I started around hundred degrees C, um, and as I went through up to 150 degrees C, uh, the ratio of those carbon gases, so the, that carbon dioxide ratio actually was starting to go, it was going up from 100 to 150 degrees C. So we're kind of normal, a little more than normal, but kind of normal hot spot temperatures we'd be looking at. Um, once I hit 150 degrees C, and between 150 and 180 degrees C, I started seeing a pretty good decrease. So now at these temperatures, I'm starting to damage that solid insulation. I'm starting to see some pretty severe breakdown of cellulose and the ratio between CO2 and CO started to decrease at this point, uh, which supported pretty much what I had seen in the field from filling when transformers failed. At that point, the element was removed from the windings and placed in the thermal well that was in contact with oil only. Uh, I did maintain that temperature at 180 degrees C. However, when, when I was no longer in contact with the, 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 the solid insulation with that, that temperature, uh, that ratio started increasing again. And I, I've got that all graphed out. I know that's kind of a convoluted explanation, but just to go, when we started at 150, at 100 degrees C, uh, and you can see that, okay, we do see a ratio moving up pretty steadily uh, until we hit about 140 degrees C. Uh, and then once we get here um, and we get to 150 degrees C, uh, we see we start seeing our first parts of hydrogen being produced. We also see that we are starting to decrease in that, that ratio uh, as that moves through. 170, we're seeing hydrogen, we're seeing a in decrease, 180, hydrogen still building, we see a decrease. Uh, that was at the point where I've removed that thermal well, that, well, the heating element from the thermal well that was in contact with the windings. I moved it to the one that was in oil only. Uh, this first increase was a bit much. Uh, I, I really feel like this was a bad sample. Uh, total combustible gas was way lower for this one. Uh, however, uh, these were in line with the other samples. And again, we are still at the, at the 180 degrees C value, but we see that this is starting to, that CO2, CO ratio is starting to move up. So when we're in contact with paper in excess of 150 degrees C, we tend to see drops. Uh, when not in contact with paper, the thermal doesn't seem to really affect the ratio that much. Um, Okay, and that was it. I thought I had some more arcing and paper ones in this one, but I apparently did not put them in, but I'm out of time anyway. So uh, a lot of information. I do apologize. I, I had to move through that rather quickly. Uh, but if you got any questions, I'd be happy to take those now. What is, what is the percentage of tap changer failures in the overall transformer failures? So if we're talking about LTC, uh, I, the last I remember looking at the double, I, th I want to say that was somewhere around 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so somewhere around that number, um, DTC failures, uh, not quite as common, but, but it does happen. What, uh, what should the alarm setting be for oil temperature? So for oil temperature, depending on the slope, uh, and don't hold me to this because it's been a while. Uh, since I did this, so first stage cooling, I think it was around 75 degrees What for top oil was where mm -hmm. we wanted to start getting alarm on that. Um, 
assume, and again, guys, I, 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 it does depend on the the rise of the transfer and all that. I, it, it seems like the best of my memory, typical was fans would be set to come on around sixty five. We would have a second stage that would come on around 75, and then we would get somewhere around there. You would also get a high, high temperature alarm. Uh, and again, that will change depending on how the transformers built, what's the rate of rise, that kind of thing. But 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 somewhere in that general vicinity. Okay, here's another one. What about silicon transformers in terms of DGA? So I just looked at one of these and. From what I could see, and I, I I didn't have any, but um, from what I could see, the so this was again, this was an example where it looked like a, some some arcing going on that didn't involve a lot of paper in this transformer. Looking at it, I, I would say that the ratios are roughly the same uh, as far as hot metal gases. What what did seem to be the exception with silicon is I did see a lot higher level of the carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. So generally with mineral, I would expect to see those somewhere around, let's just say 2,000 and 100. Uh, with this one, I think it was up around 20,000 and 200 or something like that. And that seemed to be normal for this transformer. Again, not a lot of experience with silicon uh, field, but but that that seemed to be the case. But as far as arcing and heating, the, the, those gases seem to work roughly the same. Okay, great. That was all the questions. You you made an excellent presentation, and you managed all those questions very well. <laughs> well, thank you, Rennie. And thank, thank you, you for, for having me again. Huh, Enjoyed no. it. Yeah.